Are you sick of hospital waiting times in the modern day? Well, we can't help with that, we're just a YouTube channel. However, we can make things seem a little less grim. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at hospitals and healthcare in the Middle Ages. Welcome to Medieval Madness. The medievals had three types of hospitals, the first known as the leprosaria for those afflicted with leprosy, the second were those erected for the general use of pilgrims and sick travellers, and the third were intended to give shelter to the elderly. A lot were a mixture of the three types, and all were used to look after the needs of the poor, where the inmates would receive care and possibly some rudimentary forms of treatment. Only the rich would have been able to afford the expertise of a trained physician or surgeon, and they would have been treated in their own homes. Poor sick people would have used the skills of local healers and herbalists, as well as the domestic cures passed on to them from female relatives. In England, over 700 hospitals were established in the 500 years between the Norman Conquest and the middle of the 16th century. Many dominated the landscape and were built with a lot of care and a considerable amount of investment. One of the largest in the north of England was St. Leonard's Hospital in York. As is the case with most of these once imposing medieval buildings, sadly St. Leonard's is now just a ruin. As most of these large hospitals were indistinguishable from monasteries having their own chapels, they became victims of the Reformation and were destroyed. Subsequently, this left York without a hospital from the time of Henry VIII until the middle of the 18th century. At the height of its power, St. Leonard's had 200 beds, giving it a capacity for 400 inmates. Beds were shared by patients of the same gender, and it also served as a children's home, housing 23 boys. There was a whole army of staff that helped to run the hospital, including bakers, brewers and cooks, as well as 16 servants. The Healing Power of Prayer Religion took dominance over everything else in the Middle Ages, and because of this, the appearance and purpose of a medieval hospital was very different from what we expect today. From the year 1215, admission to any hospital was not allowed unless the patient had first confessed all of their sins. Sin was thought to cause disease, so the medievals thought there was no point in trying to treat any physical symptoms until the soul had been cleansed. The health of the soul took priority over that of the body, and prayer for recovery was as important as any other treatment. The benefactors who had paid for the building of the house also had to be prayed for every day. Each patient at the St Andrews Hospital in Canterbury had to recite 300 Ave Marias, Credos and Pater Nostras daily to save their patron's souls. Anne of Bohemia, the wife of King Richard II, even had her coat of arms embossed on the ceiling of the Great Hospital in Norwich, so that just in case they forgot, as they rested there and looked up, each patient would remember who it was that had paid for the bed they were lying in. So in essence, hospitals were a religious building. Built in the shape of a cross, there would be an altar in each wing, that way the patients could see the celebration of mass at all times and many were decorated with rich Christian imagery so that the sick could meditate and cleanse their souls. Music also played an important part in the medieval healing process. At the Hospital of St Giles in Norwich, sung masses and other prayers were performed throughout the day. Physicians studied music as part of their training, and it was thought to regulate the heart rate and lift the mood. The ceilings of these institutions were designed to be lofty, as disease was thought to spread by noxious air, known as miasma. The idea was to keep the wards free from dirt and smells as much as possible to avoid any airborne odours that could corrupt the atmosphere. Many hospitals also had piped water supplies for the regular washing of laundry and efficient drainage systems to dispose of waste. Doctors and Nurses in English infirmaries, patients would have been looked after by female nurses rather than a doctor. The nurses would have been mature women. This was so that the nurses would have garnered a considerable amount of experience in all aspects of the management of a hospital, such as cooking, housekeeping and laundry work. Their maturity was also expected to be a barrier for any sexual shenanigans and scandal with the male patients. 
Unlike the rest of Europe, the English hospitals of the Middle Ages did not employ the services of any trained surgeons, physicians or apothecaries. In contrast, by the 14th century, one of the most famous infirmaries in Europe, the Santa Maria Nova in Florence, had an impressive staff. There were three junior housemen in residence, six senior physicians who visited the hospital daily, several surgeons, a pharmacist and an ophthalmic specialist. The junior housemen were obliged to train there for a period before they became fully qualified. Many town councils in Europe actually paid medical staff to work in hospitals. It wasn't until the Hospital of the Savoy was founded in London by Henry VII that an English institution finally got a doctor and a surgeon. But this wasn't until the beginning of the 16th century. Leprosaria most leper houses were established on the outskirts of towns, outside of the city walls. Not because the lepers needed to be segregated, but because the routes in and out of the cities were busier and therefore better places for the lepers to beg. Leper houses were some of the earliest hospitals, most being built between the 11th and 13th centuries, making up about a quarter of all institutions in England. Many were mixed with a combination of lepers and the elderly. At the Hospital of Buckland by Dover in southern England, lepers had to take an oath before they were admitted, and discipline was strict. Patients had to promise to be, quote, faithful and useful, sober and chast of body. By the 11th century, leprosy was endemic in England. Leprosy, known today as Hansen's disease, is a chronic illness. In the later stages, it can cause a loss of the extremities, blindness, collapse of the nose, gangrene, skin lesions, ulcers, and a weakening of the skeleton. Many believed that the pain and anguish of lepers was similar to that of the suffering of Christ. Lepers were experiencing their purgatory here on earth, meaning that they would ascend directly to heaven. This meant that they were closer to God than others, and that their carers and benefactors would also hasten their journey to heaven by lessening their own time in purgatory. The spiritual health of these patients was a priority, and emphasis was given to comforting sermons that likened their suffering to Christ. Hopefully meaning that the lepers would remain humble and accept their fate with humility. Sherburne Hospital in Durham, in the north of England, was founded near the end of the 12th century as a lazar house. It was built to house 65 poor leprous nuns and monks, and was run by three priests and a master. The patients were kept clean and were given fresh, nourishing food. Each received a loaf of bread and a gallon of beer daily. They were given meat three times a week, and on the days when meat was prohibited, they were offered eggs, cheese, and vegetables. Those who were suffering from nasal and sinus damage were given an appropriate diet. Once a week, two women washed the patients' heads and bodies. Linen undergarments were provided for those with ulcerated skin, and special footwear was given to those who had damaged feet. Clothing was washed once a week, and utensils were washed daily. Initially, the patient might be relatively mobile, and able to take part in light occupations such as gardening work or looking after livestock. Inevitably though, the sufferer would eventually need full-time care, as their condition deteriorated. But, as with Buckland, and even though the inmates were suffering from a horrific illness, discipline was still quite high. Anyone caught being disobedient was first subjected to corporal punishment with a rod, before being given a diet of bread and water. If all else failed, they were expelled from the community. Nevertheless, spaces at these leprosariums were at a premium. Lepers weren't forced to go there, they wanted to, and places were sought after. King Edward II asked the bishop that Joan, the widow of John Chamber, be admitted to Sherburn as a personal favour to himself. Chamber had served the king well against the Scots. The General Hospital These institutions housed a huge variety of patients, usually for short periods of time. Yes, some were dying or had critical illnesses, meaning they were too ill to beg, but many more were just malnourished or exhausted and needed a bed overnight and a decent meal. Many were transient travellers and pilgrims. In the summer months, the roads were packed with people needing somewhere to rest. Other hospitals took in orphaned children and pregnant women, such as the Priory of St Mary Spital, which grew to be the largest in medieval London. 
Founded by the merchants and run by Augustinian monks, St. Mary's Spital took on a special responsibility for poor pregnant women for their lying in period both before and after delivery. Accommodation was provided for them away from the main infirmary. Provision was also made for the upkeep of any children born there until the age of seven if their mother died in childbirth, which was quite common. In 15th century Florence, one in five women died whilst giving birth. Unable to look after them themselves, unmarried women often abandoned babies at hospitals. The Santa Maria della Scala in Florence had a turning box set into the wall, so that women could anonymously leave their babies. Wet nurses resided in the hospital to feed the infants of these baby deposit boxes. The Care Home Economically, the Black Death left the general population of England with a much better standard of living. If you'd like some more information on this, we have just released a documentary on the Black Death on this channel. As a consequence of this better standard of living, those who had survived the pandemic lived for much longer. But at the same time, many of the children of these aging survivors had died, and there was no longer anyone to look after them. The answer in the late medieval period was to house the infirm, disabled, and elderly in the Middle Ages equivalent of sheltered accommodation. There, both their social and spiritual needs could be catered for in a place that attended to the patient's warmth, diet, cleanliness, and spiritual serenity. The medievals were in fact quite forward-thinking in their view that improving anxiety and mental health would improve many types of illness. Taking this holistic approach, they were following the ideas of the ancient Greeks and revising them to suit their Christian beliefs. The standards of care in medieval hospitals were mixed and differed from place to place. Many had a mixture of inmates and had to adapt over time as they responded to the changes in social needs over the period. In a time before antibiotics, vaccines, and anaesthetics, the main purpose of the medieval hospital was to look after the poor, the sick, and the old. For the last days of a medieval, whose greatest wish was to die in the church, hospitals helped them to die well. It was less about curing, and more about caring. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. Do hope you've learned a few things, and we'll be back next week for another episode if you'd like to subscribe. Cheers!